important, I think, to, to express uh, the debt of gratitude that we all have to human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch, like Amnesty, uh, other organizations whose members often uh, take on great personal risks uh, in order to document and investigate these uh, abuses. And I think sometimes, uh, sometimes, unfortunately, something is lost in translation. And, and I, I, I want to begin my remarks by bringing that out. Um, I, I want to highlight, you know, two key phrases I think in 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 this in the presentation that we heard uh, from from Joe. Uh, the first one is the title of the report: "All According to Plan." This this was not accidental. Uh, this was not a mistake, this was not an oversight. This was a systematic, deliberate, well-planned effort by the state, by the armed forces, by the security forces to quell and put down what they saw as an opposition movement uh, that, that just became too inconvenient for them. This was not a violent opposition movement. This was not a militant opposition movement. These were largely unarmed protesters uh, who, who were faced and dealt with with excessive, lethal, deliberate force. So that's the first statement. The second statement is the ultimate conclusion, the final conclusion that, that Human Rights Watch uh, and other human rights organizations have come out with, and that this, this qualifies these allegations qualify as crimes against humanity. That is the magnitude of the crime that we are talking about. And I think it is very important to remember this. And it is doubly important to remember it because of the meticulous work that organizations such as Human Rights Watch have done and the, the very um, deliberate and cautious manner in which they document their findings. As, as uh, Joel emphasized to us, there is a very high standard of reliability of evidence that they will demand before allowing uh, an account to, to be rendered in, in their reports and to be relied upon in their reports. So when we look at, when we look at this, this huge uh, document, this, this comprehensive amount of work that has been done, we have to understand that what will be documented by an organization such as Human Rights Watch needs to be for us a baseline. This is the minimum. Uh, the, 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 the numbers that are given, the nature of the allegations, this is the minimum that we know has happened. And the reality uh, most likely uh, exceeds this considerably. So this was the first thing I wanted, I wanted to bring up. The second thing I want to talk about is, is something about the Egyptian regime. But I want to keep this brief because I really don't want to focus too much on the on the on this this uh, military regime uh, that has that has taken leave of, of any kind of uh, of human decency um, uh, or concern for for the people of Egypt. Uh, but it's very important to understand that in the aftermath of Rabah and even in the lead up to Rabah. This, this was a regime that is best characterized as uh, schizophrenic. As, as uh, we heard, uh, you had on the one hand a foreign minister whose uh, number one priority and what he considers his number one achievement is to try and quiet Western concerns. So there had to be arguments marshaled about the necessity for what was done in Rabaa and in other, uh, in other um, acts by the government. Um, there had to be some argument, some kind of, uh, if, we, if we say, if we can call it a whitewashing argument or a face-saving face face argument that is presented both internally to the Egyptian people and externally uh, to the world media to try and present this as a somewhat, a, a somewhat responsible or at least a necessary uh, act of government. On the other hand, uh, we see in the statements of the Prime Minister to Egyptian media, the statements of the Minister of Interior to the Egyptian media, the speeches of the Defense Minister leading up to uh, this, uh, this, these events, these sad and tragic events, uh, an almost 
a need to almost brag and boast about what they were going to do uh, and about what they did. In fact, uh, Al Biblawi, uh, speaking to ABC uh, in the aftermath of of, uh, of Rabah, uh, doesn't seem to know where he wants to land uh, in this in this uh, schizophrenic mentality. So, he, and on one hand, he tries to justify what the government has done. On the other hand, the example, the analogy that he draws to justify what has done, what has been done, is the acts or the attitude or the the uh, activities of the American government during the Vietnam War, which is quite bizarre to hear a prime minister justifying the acts of his own government against his own people by drawing an analogy to something such as the Vietnam War. Um, so I think, again, we need to understand the, the extent of, of ruthlessness that was displayed by, by, by this regime and to balance the different statements and the different attitudes uh, to understand their, their, their perceived need to do both of these things simultaneously. And that is why, why, what I want to get at. Why, why did they feel the need to almost brag and boast about this? And the reason for this is, is very clearly and this is where I want to focus most of my remarks. I don't want to talk to or about the Egyptian regime, uh, who in my mind is, is completely hopeless. I don't want to focus my remarks to or about even Western governments or international bodies such as the United Nations, to whom we, the people, have very little access. I want to talk about us and what we can do. And in order for us to talk about what we can do, we need to understand something. We need to understand not the numbers, not the anger that that we are filled with, not the sadness of uh, 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 that we feel, not the grief that we uh, need to uh, sometimes to express about Rabah and other incidents like this. But we really need to focus about the meaning of Rabah, uh, and the meaning of Rabah starts with this attitude of the military that felt that they needed to boast and brag to their audience. It starts with the ability of the military controlled and state controlled uh, and capital interest controlled media in Egypt to divide the Egyptian people into what they literally what they literally dubbed as two peoples. We are a people and they are a people. This, this kind of divided society cannot survive. This kind of divided society, this kind of divisiveness, really speaks to the poverty of the Egyptian soul, the poverty of the Egyptian mind, the poverty of the Egyptian character that has been accumulating over the last six decades. And our first starting point as activists is to try and address this poverty of character. We need to address this divisiveness, this animosity that has been built up within the one people, within the one nation. That has to be the starting point for any hope for the future of Egypt and the region. Uh, a second point that is quite apart from this, but, but indicated by the same attitude, this idea, this success, unfortunately, to label one people versus another people and to, to derive from that popular support, make no mistake, there was popular support among a significant fraction of the population for what the army and the police did that day. And that is that you cannot you cannot begin to protect or defend human rights, human life, and human dignity if you are going to parcel it out and try to defend only some human rights or some human life or some human dignity. Someone for whom I, I have much respect has said that, uh, that there was a dress rehearsal for Rabah two years earlier. And that dress rehearsal became known as the, the, the Maspiro incident. In the Maspiro incident, the army, the leadership of the army, 
covertly or behind the scenes invited and encouraged Coptic activists to demonstrate in Maspiro in front of the media uh, 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 institutions in Egypt. And then that same army turned around and massacred those activists. But they were able to, to draw upon resentment and divisiveness and, and hatred in Egyptian society to say that these Copts did not deserve the anger or the defense or the response, the adequate response from the rest of the people. They, much the same accusations that were made against the protesters in Rabaa, except in Rabaa they were labeled as the Islamists, they were labeled as the Muslim Brotherhood. Right? And in, in, in uh, Maspiro they were labeled as the, the Copts and the, the outsiders, and the minority. But the same, the same kind of accusations that they were armed, that they attacked the police, that they attacked the army, that they, that they were saboteurs, that they were inconvenient, that they, all of these things, they are not us, and therefore you should not defend them. Once we allow that principle to stand, then, then there is no such thing as a defense of human rights, or human life, or human dignity. We have to take a principled stand and understand that human dignity comes from the, fa from the humanity of the person. And, and the, the, the right to life is attached to the humanity of the person. And political divisions or differences or religious differences or ethnic differences or any other kinds of differences cannot blind us to the, import, to the sanctity of human life, human dignity, and human rights. The third point that I would like to make in regards to this is, as I said, I don't want to speak to or about Western governments. But we, living in Canada, living in the West, we have to ask ourselves why Western governments do this? Why Western governments get away with this? So there's a very simple answer. We, the people, do not make it a priority. If we, the people, believed that our government needs to take a stand for human rights, if we, the people, believed that it is more important for our government to take a stand for human rights than to make some commercial deal and bring in money to Canadian companies or American companies or Western companies or what have you, if we made it clear to our political representatives that when the day comes to vote, we will think about human rights before we think about what they did for commerce or for trade, then they will make it a priority. Unfortunately, the state of affairs is that we, the people, do not make it enough of a, of prior, of a priority. And it is our responsibility, not theirs. So we have to make sure that we speak up. We have to make sure that we reach out. We have to make sure that we remind one another of the sanctity of human life, human dignity, and human rights for all human beings. And we have to communicate that to our governments. And we have that ability. It's very simple. We, the, the, the politicians, politicians would put their hand up and see which way the wind is blowing. And if we don't prioritize it, then all of the efforts and all of the calls by organizations such as Human Rights Watch are going to fall on deaf ears. There is a reason why they have not been able to get to convince Western governments of stopping uh, support uh, and aid to the military and the security forces in Egypt and in other countries like this. There is a reason why there is no traction in the United Nations for an independent inquiry uh, on something like Egypt because simply people do not prioritize it enough, and that is our job. And that means that we have to educate others. Each of us has a sphere of influence, each of us has reach. And we have to speak, and we have to educate others, and we have to be principled about it and stand up for all human rights, and all human life, and all human dignity. Uh, but we have to bring these issues alive if we are to make any kind of, of movement forward. Rabaa was a tragedy. Rabaa was a catastrophe. Rabaa 
lives in our hearts and, and, and evokes so much emotion and so much sometimes it drives us almost to despair. But I think we need to think about it differently. We need to think about what we can do to change the state of reality today. And what we can do is number one, be principled. Number two, focus on what we individually can do. And number three, reach out. Reach out to everyone who has been a victim of injustice. Reach out to the people who are victims of ignorance, who do not realize what is going on or do not understand or do not have enough data about what is happening and, and, and really put this on the agenda and, and force the politicians to understand that they have to respond to what has happened in Egypt and what is happening elsewhere. Uh, I, I, with that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to open it up for uh, discussion and I'd like to invite uh, Joe, if you can, if you'd be willing to come back up here, please, and, and maybe field uh, some questions. Thank you. month to do it, but, you know, to find a, a kind of an anniversary date, a, a hook, as we say, to, uh, to have some kind of event in Ottawa. Um, alternatively, have some sort of uh, uh, public uh, gathering, conference, uh, press conference, whatever, where you'd have some sympathetic members of the parliament to attend. Um, have them raise questions with the Minister of Foreign Affairs about what Canada is, uh, and obviously everything I say about Canada is applicable to the USA, to the UK, and so forth, um, to, uh, to raise questions in Parliament uh, to the Minister of Foreign Affairs about policy on X, Y, and Z. Why don't you, know, why don't you do this? Why don't you, have you done that? Uh, specifically, you know, the UN, um, uh, you know, the most appropriate venue for anything in the UN is the Human Rights Council. But the Human Rights Council is like, like the Security Council, like the General Assembly. Um, it's, it's member states, okay? Uh, it's some 50 or 53 member states and the, there's sort of rotation. 
And so those states include such stalwart human rights defenders currently as Saudi Arabia, okay? So, you know, that's, that's kind of what you're dealing with. Specifically, the Human Rights Council meets three times a year in Geneva. They're regular sessions. Sometimes they have emergency sessions as well. Egypt would have been very appropriate for an emergency session, of course, but that moment has passed. Um, and so far, we and, and other people working on these issues uh, have not been successful in finding kind of that critical mass of member states who would lead on a resolution setting up such a, a commission, or even a resolution that would strongly criticize the government, frankly. Um, we, the next regular session is in September, this so just a, a month away. Um, we have been uh, uh, without success so far in getting any commitment from any state, and we're talking about even a small state without, you know, particular trades or investments or military sales or one thing or another um, that might prevent them or give them, caution them from taking the lead on such a measure. We can't even get or we haven't yet been able to get even the United States, and we don't, frankly, I don't have much hope to get them to take the lead on such a resolution, but we'd at least get them to stand out of the way <laughs> and let it go forward. Um, it's a very difficult sell, and it's not just the United States and Canada. France, as you know, has been making uh, you know, rather very large military sales to the Egyptian government just in 2016. Um, they have, uh, 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 we had uh, CC in, in Berlin a couple of months ago. There have been visits of Hollande uh, was in, uh, in Egypt, uh, what, several, six, seven weeks ago. I mean, not that long ago. Were these issues raised? Well, when we talk to members of the government in, in Paris or in Washington or in Ottawa, oh, yes, of course, we raise, we, every time we get together, we raise these issues. Well, you know, I, I somehow doubt it. Uh, and do they raise them in, oh, you know, by the way, we're concerned about the human rights situation, you know, move on to the next topic, you know? Or is it, you know, really serious? Let's talk about the case of, you know, so and so, Leila Labas, let's talk about the case of Abu Fatah, let's, and, 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 you know, let's get down to details. Somehow, I doubt it. And that's, those are the kinds of questions and the kinds of you know, public attention to bring to um, to, to the public in Canada. Uh, again, hard to believe you couldn't find one or a couple of sympathetic lawmakers, legislators, uh, who could uh, take this up. Um, you have uh, Canadian, uh, there have been Canadian Egyptian victims of the repression uh, who should be, uh, you know, part of the team, so to speak. Um, uh, just, just some, and of course, media, speaking with uh, uh, edit, the editorial boards of uh, the major uh, newspapers, trying to get on, uh, get on talk shows, uh, um, a television or uh, radio talk shows. So anyway, just a couple of thoughts along those lines. Are there questions or comments?
It seemed like from the Mubarak government to the democratically elected government of Morsi to the current military regime, it's all the same. Um, and that, that is a political statement. If it's all the same, if all of them are just equally bad, uh, then, then why should anyone uh, care or take action? Uh, I wonder if you have any reflections on this. Well, uh, look, I think the situation, I, it would be wrong to say it's all the same, okay? In fact, we have said, I believe publicly, that it's worse now than it was under previous regimes, including Mubarak, okay? You know, frankly, we weren't around when uh, President Nasser held the reins. Things were pretty bad under President Nasser. We're not, you know, we weren't around to research that, so we're gonna, we don't make, we certainly talk about this, the situation today being worse than under Mubarak, even in its, uh, its worst phases, which even Mubarak wasn't the same, you know, for 30 years. That's there were, you know, crests and, and, and trousers. Um, I think I have all the confidence in the world that our representatives in Cairo, uh, or outside of Cairo, uh, were scrupulously apolitical uh, in terms of the way they framed things as well as what they focused on and so forth. Um, so I would put the challenge back to you if you have some something in mind about where we were <clears throat> somehow straight over the line of being uh, apolitical. Certainly, our intent is to be scrupulously uh, impartial, is the best word to put it. So reporting on violations uh, where we see them. Now, in a country like Egypt, you know, there are more violations, especially today, but not only today, uh, more than we can possibly devote our limited resources to. So we pick and choose. Um, but we try and focus on the worst abuses at any particular time. Um, we, talk, we try and focus on abuses, you know, do, um, do they, the ones that affect them the greatest number of people. Uh, and then lastly, uh, one of the criteria we use is we try and pick uh, abuses where we might be able to have some positive impact. Now, to be honest with you, I don't think we ever had any illusions that on something like Rabat or that series of you know, incidents of police killings that we would have a lot of influence. But it affected so many people. It was of such a, a gross nature, we could not focus on it. But it, it required, you know, we, we kind of have to have a, we can't do it all, we can't do everything. No one organization can. Um, uh, it's very difficult for us, we can't get in. I can't visit Egypt uh, currently, and I'm very sad about that, because it's a place I loved. I would typically, in my many years at Human Rights Watch, we go a couple of times a year uh, to meet with not only my staff, but you know, Egyptian colleagues. Egyptian colleagues who are now under travel bans who can't come out of the country uh, to Montreal or New York or other places that they, they might come to, they have come to in the past. So it's a really difficult situation and it's much, you know, we're, we're, there are a number of countries in the Middle East as well as elsewhere in the world that don't allow us in to do our work. We still do the work. We still criticize them. But I don't mind admitting to you that it's much more difficult when we're not in the country, when we can't be approaching uh, you know, witnesses directly, when we can't be attending trials, and you know, this kind of thing, which is the kind of thing we would do if we were there. So, you know, we're, and where our Egyptian colleague organizations are operating under such a hammer, okay, and under such threats, I mean, just, I think, upcoming, uh, maybe next week, I'm not sure of the date, there's a, a case against a number of human rights defenders, Egyptian human rights, uh, Sampakat, Kamal Aid, uh, a number of people who are under, they're under threat of having their assets seized, that is, their bank accounts, okay, seized. Uh, that's just one step, but, you know, they're also under travel bans. Um, they're also under threat of prosecution for violating these uh, uh, regulations against foreign funding and one thing, anyway, they're under very serious threat of not only being able to not leave Egypt, but actually being, being imprisoned and being impoverished. Uh, you know, I, I don't, it, it's, it's so hard to, uh, for, for me, I and mean, these are people I know, and 
be considered to be dear friends who are under such threat, and it's, you know, our ability to mobilize on their behalf is extremely limited. Um, but, you know, it's, it's what we, but anyway, again, challenge back to you. If there, if there are areas or times when we uh, didn't handle it right in your view, I'd like to know about it. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Okay, with that, uh, I'm going to call the, uh, the session to a close, but I'd like to remind all of you of our, uh, our program. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, two sessions. Uh, the first will be uh, at uh, 9 o'clock, uh, and the, uh, the subject of that is, the, is journalism and the state of journalism in Egypt. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Masri, who's an expert on, uh, on journalism in Egypt and was in and uh, uh, up until and after the, the coup uh, has done much work on analyzing the discourse in Egyptian media he will be speaking. And then in the afternoon at 1 o'clock, uh, Western application of universal value and specifically trade with dictators. Uh, we hear from uh, Peggy Mason, who is the president of the Rito Institute, and, and maybe we will take up some of these, these themes uh, that have been brought up today. So I invite you to join us. Uh, all of the sessions are in this room, and for uh, our viewers online, uh, you, you know how to, uh, how to follow us. Thank you.